Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Mark Cowardin. I'm the uh, chair of Fine Arts Photo and Film here at JCCC. Um, before I get too involved in introducing our guest speaker today, I want to talk just briefly about how we got here. Um, earlier this year, in the summer sometime, um, the Fine Arts Department, Fine Arts Film and Photo Department, uh, received a donation, kind of a generous donation from, from the Jadell Family Foundation to help us start a visiting artist program. Um, traditionally, we've never had a visiting artist program, and so it's kind of an exciting time for us because we're just trying to figure out how to make all this work. Um, you know, so we'll, basically we're going to bring in a handful of artists per year, doing a variety of things, sometimes a lecture, sometimes a, a demonstration. Our first Actually, a presentation happened last week. Uh, Chandra Debuse uh, came and did a, a kind of a hands-on pottery workshop. And so um, as we move on with this, we'll probably try and get better at advertising these sorts of things and so we can get as many people in here as we, as we can. We do have two uh, visiting artists coming in soon. So I guess um, those of you that are part of campus look for the info list information on November 7th. We have Gene uh, Genevieve Flynn coming in to do um, a uh, metal smithing hands-on workshop, and she will be doing a presentation of her work in ATB 115. That's on no November 7th. November 15th, we're bringing in Glenisha Johnson, uh, a Kansas City painter, if I'm saying that correctly, right, Misha? On November 15th, and, and, and Glenisha will be speaking in the uh, painting studios, ATB 101. So again, look for that information as, as we move forward. So thank you very much to the, the, the Jadell Family Foundation for the grant that's um, allowing us to do this. So. Um, I'm, I'm pretty excited to be here today. So a, a long time ago, when I was in graduate school in Arizona, I uh, went to the Arizona State University Art Museum and saw an exhibition that was called uh, Contemporary Art from Cuba, Irony and Survival on the Utopian Island. Uh, that was the first time that I was exposed to um, or encountered the work of, of Alexander Erechea. I'm going to try to get his name right. Um, who at the time was, was working as a founding member of the collaborative group Los Carpinteros, um, which is a, a collaborative group of Cuban artists, um, and their work incorporated aspects of architecture, design, and sculpture to create installations and drawings that exquisitely uh, negotiate the space between function and non-function, and express uh, their, their interests in, in the intersection of art and society in a humorous manner. Um, in 2003, Alexander returned to uh, an individual practice as an artist and then he fo focusing on large-scale sculptural installations and watercolors. Alex is a sculptor, painter, and video artist who divides his time between New York, Madrid, Havana, and Miami. Uh, his work generally consists of visual metaphors that address the interconnectedness of urban design with systems of power and surveillance and, spo and, and social topics like cultural inequity, cultural disenfranchisement, and disputed position of art in, in a global media-driven society. Uh, best known for his uh, 200, 2013 No Limits project, uh, which consisted of 10 large-scale sculptures of bent and twisted iconic New York buildings installed on, along Park Avenue. Um, Erechea won the Howard and Patricia Farber Foundation's Artist of the Year Award at the 2015 Havana Biennial and was featured in the 2016 uh, Coachella Music Festival in Palm Springs, California, uh, with the monumental sculpture Katrina Chair, which is, he's pictured here with. Um, he has, has, exhibitions, has had exhibitions at dozens of international venues, including the Venice, Sao Paulo, Havana, Shanghai, Taipei, and Guangzhou Biennials. And most recently, uh, Alex was included in the open spaces at Kansas City, which was curated by Dan Cameron, and you have just a few days left to take in open spaces, so hurry up. Um, so he, he has sculpture uh, uh, in Swope Park called Meet and Music. Um, when does that come down officially? Uh, Sunday. Oh, so hurry. You have until Sunday, right? So um, please join me in welcoming um, Alexander Arachea. Well, first, uh, thank you, Mark for giving me this opportunity uh, to be here to be here today is uh, is part of a long journey obviously and part of that journey is uh, thanks to Dan Cameron 
the creator of the project Open Spaces, who brought me here last year and uh, uh, for the first time uh, to visit Kansas City. And, um, and I didn't know exactly what was Kansas City before. And to find out that it was a thriving city that has a lot to offer, that brought me a lot of excitement. And I definitely wanted to get involved in this project of uh, open spaces and, and to do my best in order to, to start a dialogue that, I mean, this talk today confirmed uh, what we started last year with open spaces and is now going into different directions. Uh, so for me, it's a real pleasure to be able to address, you know, some words about my work and also to really uh, thank uh, um, Kansas City for uh, bringing me here and, and, in, and being part of the community, of the art community, like uh, I'm experiencing it right now. Uh, obviously, to, to start with, I would like to introduce uh, my presentation at, uh, at Open Spaces at Swole Park. Uh, uh, this idea uh, was born out of uh, that first uh, visit that I did to Kansas City. I didn't frankly know what to do in order to engage uh, with the city, but the idea of recognize, uh, uh, you know, how music has been, uh, you know, fundamental to to the culture in, in the city, and also to understand that meat is a big thing here, I was like, well, you know, it seems like this doesn't like merge, but why not? And somehow, like, you know, if we refer to music, uh, we understand that jazz specifically is uh, one of those that really hit the, the, the floor in Kansas City, and that, uh, music make us dance. I depart from that first uh, idea, how music makes the body to move, and in return, how that body can make the music play in different ways in order to create this dialogue. And uh, departing from that uh, uh, thinking, I thought it was it could be a good opportunity to create an object that merge both things and create that third uh, idea, which in a way is, um, um, is, is a possibility that I had, you know. This idea of creating the dialogue between music and meat in ways, because, I mean, uh, meat in the way that I'm using the meat thermometer, which is, uh, was the object that for me was more logical in, in order to create a, a dialogue. Uh, and create this uh, particular idea. And uh, like um, Mark was saying, that it will be on show until Sunday. Uh, so for those of you who haven't seen it, I encourage you to go and see it because uh, I think the experience with the object itself, it, it really creates something different, you know. Um, uh, uh, well, that's meat uh, uh, and music. And I would like to, uh, you know, start, and normally I, I, I hate to, to go to the beginning, but it makes a lot of sense to, to start from uh, the early uh, stage of my work back in Havana in 2003 and four, when I was um, at the time uh, uh, deciding of uh, leaving this project that I have been part of for more than 11, 12 years, um, uh, which was part of me uh, at that moment, but at, as an artist uh, as, and as a student, I was taught at the time that art is about language, and you have to push uh, as much as you can in order to bring uh, a new ideas. And for me, the project of Los Carpinteros was an exceptional uh, moment in my life, but I needed to go further. And to go on my own was part of that, uh, uh, and I'm, I'm still doing it. <laughs> it's interesting because these days I'm thinking in, in, in new collaboration with other artists in a different way, 
but it, this is something that I can explain after I finish uh, this presentation. Well, uh, to start with these uh, two photographs that you are looking at at the moment, this is, um, is um, uh, Architectural Elements, is the title. And Architectural Elements uh, is a f the one of those, it's not the first time, but it's, you know, the, that opportunity that I have with photography and the way I approached photography in those uh, early days was mostly documenting the process of making my work. And through that documentation, obviously, new ideas pop, pop up, you know. Uh, in the case of architectural elements, I was invited to create, uh, I, I was invited to organize a show for the only uh, alternative space that existed at the time in Havana called Aglutinador. And this space mostly was showing uh, work of um, people under-recognized, people that, that doesn't necessarily have a career. In my case, I had a career, but I was starting again. And they thought that was a good opportunity to bring my new ideas into their space. So I decided to create for, uh, for them, uh, rather than bringing either drawings or paintings, um, to extend that invitation that they gave me to others as well. So my idea was at the time to create in the room that they gave me to show my work an additional room, uh, and that room was the place where I invited other artists to exhibit their work that nobody has seen. So in that sense, uh, for me to extend that was the, the, the basic idea. But by doing that, you have, in, I mean, the scarcity of materials in Cuba is, is noticeable, so to find bricks and concrete, I mean, cement and all that, it takes time. And in the case of the bricks, is something that I found in an old construction. And, uh, you know, I was documenting the whole process of taking these uh, bricks to the, to the car that we will take them to the, to, the, to the exhibition. And I was taking those pictures. And something popped up in my mind, like, why not to do something with that too? That moment, that process was important. So I come up with this idea of uh, architectural elements, which is carrying the bricks to do this uh, construction, but at the same time, the, the, the action in itself contains a lot of uh, information that I thought was valuable in order to create uh, another work. Uh, this is the, the actual piece that I did uh, uh, at Aglutinador in 2004, and as you can tell, it's a very tiny space, but it's provided with illumination, uh, a TV screen, in, in a, a little one inside, and it is a very narrow space, obviously, but also that speaks about the lack of alternative spaces in Cuba and how difficult it is to create that. Uh, so it was a social commentary on this situation in Cuba, particularly in those years. Continuing with this idea of a space and how a space dictate our behavior uh, I wanted to uh, understand, you know, uh, departing from, let's say, the experiments of uh, Joseph Boyce with the social sculpture, I wanted to create a, um, a, an opportunity where, like, the, the different elements that, that, uh, that participate in a gallery, like, let's say, the artist, the, the critics, the spectator, uh, bring them to a new uh, area where they might seem out of their, uh, of their field. So, and I organized this project that was titled uh, Sweat, and Sweat was set in this um, um, public school, in the, in the basketball court of a public school in Havana, near my neighborhood. And uh, so what I did, I invited two, two teams of like, you know, uh, kids uh, from around the block, uh, to, to play, uh, we organized this game, and the reward for that was, uh, well, they, they were not kids, they were, were young guys, uh, a, a can, I mean, a, a box of beers. So everybody was excited with the idea, you know. So I organized that game, and while, you know, the game was happening, I was filming what was going on on the backboard. Uh, you know, that moment when the ball gets into the hoop, and I took that uh, documentation, edited, 
and then organized a third, a, a second event that was the presentation of that game on that same backboard, but only that there are no uh, players. These are like just the, the image of the, and I invited a friend of mine, artist, Raul Cordero, to play uh, the sound uh, recorded of, out of that game. So uh, all of a sudden, people are in the, in, in, in the basketball court with no players, but again, the game is happening around them. So you can hear the voices, the noises, you know, that moment when the ball gets into the hoop. But this idea that the spectators are unable to change the result of that game, although they are in the, in the, in the basketball court, you know. Uh, so there's also a social commentary here about this idea of being unable to change uh, a game that is already being pre-designed by others, you know. <laughs> Moving forward, uh, I continue uh, with, you know, exploring on the idea of a space in a different way because it's just, this is one of my goals, is try to understand how we, you know, how to behave uh, towards space in, in, from different perspectives. In the case of this particular piece, which is titled Dust, uh, I focus mostly on the idea of, for years, for many years, I have been grabbing dirt and debris from places where I have lived, whether it's in New York, in Havana, Mexico City, Los Angeles, Madrid, and I have a collection of these tiny boxes that contain this uh, uh, dust and debris. I'm like, uh, what am I going to do with all this? It doesn't make any sense. But all of a sudden, I realized, why not to show these memories? Uh, um, make them visible, you know? But at the same time, to show them in ways that these memories obviously are fragile. The idea of dust is once it disappears, everything is, you know, is gone. So I decide, I mean, this is a struggle that you have with memory and the fragility. Uh, I thought it will be a, a beautiful idea to put them in a container that also talks about fragility. And in this case, I produced this uh, life-size punching bags, uh, which somehow uh, resemble this uh, this fight that we all had, we all have with, with memories. And the idea, the, the way to have access to that memory is obviously will be by breaking the, the punching bag. It is interesting because one of the things that many collectors uh, at some point refuse uh, to have these pieces is because of fragility. And I remember um, uh, um, Peggy Cooper who sadly, uh, uh, died uh, last year, was one of those collectors who decided to buy one of those punching bags. Uh, the punching bag has stayed at her house for like quite amount of years, but uh, Peggy sadly lost her house in a fire. And that punching bag, along with many of the works at the collection, disappeared. And I was tempted to ask for the ashes of the remains of that, but that was too much. But, you know, I'm telling the story to understand, you know, how the, these works somehow reflect on an idea that is closer than we think is, you know, the idea of losing. And in this case, we lost the punching bag, we lost the memories, we lost everything. But, you know, I think it is an exercise for me that was important to, to address. Um, talking about surveillance, uh, is, which is one of the, the topics that I have been uh, dealing with for many years, and I think I have other examples that talks about that more uh, straightforward. But in the case of this particular piece, this was uh, exhibited in 2006. I think it was my first museum show as a solo artist. Uh, and when the museum asked me to create uh, something for, for them, uh, I didn't obviously what to do, but uh, you know, they gave me you know, a certain amount of money and the time, and I asked them if I was able to use the surveillance system of the, 
of the museum to be part of my work. And they were kind of, you know, weird with that, but at some point they decide why not? And they gave me the opportunity, uh, rather than to use their, uh, you know, their system, for me to record with my own system, you know, uh, the people entering to the museum. I wanted to address the idea of how museums uh, deal with uh, the quantity rather than quality of people getting into their rooms. And um, so I wanted to, you know, work with this idea of how surveillance and uh, understanding the amount of people that get into a certain space, how that works. And I come up with this idea that I title uh, a perpetual free entrance, which gave me another trouble with the museum. Because I remember I told them, listen, we need to put this as a big sign at the entrance of the museum, and they refused to do it. <laughs> because uh, it can be misunderstood and uh, you have to pay to get into the museum. This is not for free. And then, uh, but you know, it was part of the idea, you know, to play a little bit and to push to those limits. And um, so what you are looking at right now is a sort of a, a stadium and that the entrances of the stadium are blocked by these uh, TV screens that they depict the images of people entering to the museum. But at the time that they are doing it to the main door of the museum, they are going straight into my work. Whether they are visiting my work or not, they are contained by that. And that, you know, it brings all this relationship that we have with museums and, and, the, and the role of the viewer, the artist, and to engage that in a, some sort of a problematic, because at the same time, the stadium was built in, uh, in, a, in, a, in a size that it looks that is accessible because it's big. But at the same time, the steps are tiny that you barely can climb on it. And obviously, the, the, the guys at the museum, they won't allow you to do it. But at the same time, it's, it's to play with all those limits and make them visible or not and create this. Um, this um, this uh, work, which also includes video, is uh, titled White Corner. Uh, White Corner has a, a you know, has a, kind of interesting story because this, I take advantage of the idea of, uh, of, of the corner as a prominent element in any uh, construction, but also at the same time, I'm using the idea of the ambush because the corner gives me that possibility to play with those two sides. You don't know what's going on on the other side. So how architecture, you know, uh, you know, help to, to, to build who we are somehow, you know. And in the case of this particular piece, and I was explaining this to Mark, uh, you know, uh, a few minutes ago, um, I was given, uh, you know, a gift by my grandfather a, a lot of years ago before he died. And he gave me this uh, beautiful machete. Uh, and when he gave me the machete, he told me, uh, you have to understand that that machete is being at the family for many years. And I have to tell you that that machete, uh, during the independence war in Cuba, uh, to get free from the Spaniards colony, uh, it cut heads. And I was like, wow, that's, that's tough. Uh, so he handed that to me, and I was like, what I was supposed to do with that machete? I mean, like, this is, uh, this is serious stuff. But um, so I, I put it in a corner in my house in Havana. I, I let it there for a certain amount of years. But then I remember when I turned 30, my friend Agoberto Rodriguez gave me a bat, a baseball bat. And so I'm like, wow, everybody's giving me weird tools but anyway this is <laughs> this is interesting so i place it near the machete and it was there for x amount of years and everybody that comes to my house at the time was like alice what's going on with you <laughs> and i'm like well you know those are gifts that i was given so uh you know eventually they're there but you know what i think i have to do something with it 
And in 2006, I decide, uh, since I'm trying to understand a space and, you know, that fight that we engage when living in or experiencing architecture, why not to bring those two topics of the machete and the baseball bat into a, an actual battle? And I took, obviously, uh, that a specific year of my life, I was dealing with a battle in my head because I have left already for three years the group that I, I used to work with, but I still have, you know, that fight. I am who I am, or I am those three, you know, that. So I decide to put into place this battle, you know, personal battle into a public battle. And the, the recording of the, of the video performance uh, was done indoors. So there are elements that you don't see at, at the image, but you know, in this area here, right here, these are like the, the, the electricity, the connectors. So that tells you that was filmed indoors. So I'm exposing all that into the outdoors, you know, to the public uh, uh, field. Talking about public field is this project that I was able to do back in 2008. I was invited by my dear friend Dan Cameron to be part of Prospect One uh, at that year. An extraordinary uh, event for me. It was the first time visiting uh, New Orleans, a city that I cherish and I love a lot. And Dan, obviously, he always pushed you to those limits. And, uh, and um, the idea of uh, exhibiting a work that relates to, to the city was kind of key, you know? And, you know, I've been experiencing ideas previously with New Orleans, even way before uh, exhibiting with Dan at that moment. But the idea that in 2005, the Katrina storm had hit badly the city uh, gave me, uh, you know, some kind of a opportunity to talk about that. And all the aftermath of what happened with uh, the Katrina in, in New Orleans and sadly, you know, all the events that surrounds that moment. So one of the things for me was to work with materials that are found. And in this case, wood that was found uh, at the Mississippi River. And um, by taking that wood, I decided why not to create this bucket in the shape of, let's say, the the, the Mississippi River, you know, like the, the affluence of the Mississippi River. And I come up with this uh, bucket, which is the title of the piece, Mississippi Bucket, which somehow resembled the levees of the, of the river itself. And uh, so interesting enough, like even people thought that this piece was about to participate and people got into the piece and they start walking inside the bucket and eventually the bucket got damaged at some point and again this idea of breaking apart the levees or the bucket it remains a, something that is present that is coming back all the time so mississippi bucket is one of those first projects uh, along with the previous experience that i have had in havana about public spaces and how to deal with public space and the, uh, the idea of taking the elements of the city and turn it into part of your work and start that dialogue, which is the seed of the future work that I'm going to be continue doing after this. This, um, this um, particular project, which is titled Pregón, uh, Pregón is a way of like, uh, you know, like the peddlers, they do sell in the streets, like singing, and I thought that was interesting to, to, to title this particular piece that talks who, uh, precisely about the idea of control rather than uh, 
rather than the peddlers singing in the streets. But the idea of like singing or playing a music that might be interesting enough that you don't want to leave that uh, situation. But obviously, controls plays those songs too. It is something that, uh, especially I have to talk about the idea as a Cuban being raised in Cuba and uh, understanding that, you know, that the ways that Cuba as a country was run and the idea of taking advantage of the island surrounded by water and unable to escape, it is something that is present here, this idea of not being able to escape. So Pregón plays in different uh, levels, but obviously is, is something that uh, for me, it relates definitely to Cuba. This piece, which is uh, the room of everything, it was my presentation for the 11th Havana Biennial in, in Cuba. At the time, I'm, I'm, al I'm already living in Spain. I'm not living in Cuba. Uh, so my experience with the work is totally different. I'm trying to learn new things, and I'm on them, and I'm still trying to learn in that, is NASDAQ. The idea of relating uh, you know, the index of NASDAQ to our reality. The idea of how, of the, how that a, 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 uh, index uh, is reflect in our daily uh, life. But obviously, by bringing that to Cuba, Cuba doesn't understand that because they, they, we don't even know what NASDAQ is. But it's interesting to bring topics that I'm starting to be familiar with in order to, to teach them to others how I perceive that. And in this case, uh, the room of everything, it, is, it was done by daily changing the distances between those uh, metal, uh, let's say, facades. Every time the Dow Jones changes, I mean, the Dow Jones is not that, the Dow Jones changes. During the day, it's reflected on this structure. So the structure gets either narrower or, or get together depending on how the Dow Jones is during the day is doing during the day. So that was basically uh, the idea behind this particular work, which is like trying to bring something totally new to a context that is not familiar with it. In 2010, I was given the, the first opportunity to do uh, uh, this presentation at Times Square in New York City. And by that, time of we have already like two years in the recent uh, more terrific oh not terrific but the uh, horrible crisis economic crisis experience in, in our life and um, and to exhibit in, in, in this particular period as NASDAQ specifically it obviously brings a lot of uh, strange feelings about how uh, that crash uh, became a reality. And somehow these works kind of becomes an answer to it. It is a, a work that is a, uh, this uh, wrecking ball that hit the surface of the building and bounced back. It is a video projection, but it creates that idea of like questioning the surface or the building where that image is projected. I have to tell the story about this piece because this piece was born actually in Spain. I was, I was invited to exhibit a project at Casa de America, which is one of the main institutions that deal with the dialogue between Spain and Latin America. And I was given the opportunity to, to exhibit there and I come up with the idea of creating a wrecking ball out of uh, rubber and place it at the front of the, uh, of the facade of the building. And I was approved. Uh, but like a week before uh, starting to install the piece, I was uh, sent a letter of uh, canceling my project. And I was like, why? 
So nobody explained that to me. Uh, I was paid for the expenses of producing the, the work and all that, but nobody explained me that, why that happened all of a sudden. Obviously, there was a political situation uh, at the time, and the director of this institution didn't want to be on the focus of the newspapers because his wife was at the time promoted for the first time as the first female a head of the military in Spain. So he didn't want to get involved in too many issues, especially when that piece might look like I'm questioning whether his position or not, which is not the case. For me, it was more about that Trump alert, that you are looking at something that is basically attempting against the building, but actually what he's trying to do is create a dialogue. This is a bouncing ball that doesn't damage. It's, it's more about like exercising that, but obviously the image of a wrecking ball was uh, strong enough to cancel that. And uh, I didn't think at the time that I was, uh, you know, censor or anything like that, but I thought that my work was not complete, that I needed to create a piece that rather works that doesn't. So I created this video projection in order to to project that wherever I want without even having a permission. But by projecting the image of a wrecking ball toward a specific building, you will raise uh, questions about that specific uh, structure. And that was what I was trying to, to, to do with this particular work, which was exhibited at NASDAQ and, uh, during that time and definitely brought a lot of uh, attention toward the idea of, of what we are, we're experiencing with uh, what happened around NASDAQ and all that. Well, this picture belongs to a second invitation that I was uh, given in New York City back in 2013. Uh, I submitted a proposal to the Park Avenue Board. They yearly uh, receive a proposal from artists, and along with galleries, they help to organize projects that are shown uh, on the Park Avenue malls. And I was given that opportunity. Uh, and for me, you know, New York is being a place, like I'm sure for you too, is a, you know, that is, is part of you. You have seen it for so many years and it's part of your, you know, essence in your mind. That you always have the tendency to, you know, if I, if, I'm given the opportunity one day to do something, what I will do in New York City. And for me, it was interesting because in the beginning, when I decide that I want to use New York architecture, and mainly those uh, landmarks that are well known by everybody, you know, uh, you name it, uh, Empire State Building, Chrysler, uh, Hemsley, you know, Sherry Netherland, uh, Flat Iron Building, those landmarks are well known by everybody. Why not to play with those iconic buildings that are even touristic, that people doesn't want to pay that much attention to it. But at the same time, they are a very strong icon that can actually appeal to everybody rather than the art world by itself. And that was one of my goals. And I created this project, which essentially was to turn those landmarks into different shapes. These shapes, they uh, variate, uh, but they, some of them resemble the, the, the symbols of the snake that bites its own tail, like the Uroboro, which is that symbol. Then I created the, this particular, uh, it is thing here, this particular piece here, which is the, the courthouse, I turn it into a traffic barrier. Uh, the Empire State Building turned it into a Pentagon, talking about, you know, after 9-11, the experience of 9-11, uh, how New York somehow was militarized in that sense. And, you know, bringing elements to the architecture that are not something that relate to it. An architecture that rather that it stay the same, it is always changing. Because architecture, the way I see it, you know, and 
you are going to agree with me, it changed value, it changed functions. And based on those uh, idea of, of transformation, I wanted to reflect on that and create this parallel city that talk about this idea of the city constantly transforming into another thing. I, I have here these two photographs. The first one is a watercolor because I, although I didn't bring uh, a lot of watercolor, I wanted to introduce you to the idea that part of my process when creating my work is uh, to do preparatory uh, drawings. And those drawings for me are essential. They mostly are large, large size in order to, you know, to get closer to the size of the actual size of things and to experience that idea with the space in, in, in that sense. And then one below is one uh, general view of the project being exhibited at Park Avenue. That particular red piece is the Cherry Netherlands Hotel, turn it into a snake that bites its own tail. And here you can see the entire project of the, I mean, uh, eight of them. They are 10 buildings in total. And each one, you know, point out to a different direction, I, I believe. The one on top, this is the Hamsley building. This is the, I forgot the name of this one. This is the blah, blah. Empire State, the Flatiron. This is the, um, the Seagram building. This is the MetLife Tower, the courthouse, and the Chrysler building. Uh, you know, after I've, you know, uh, finished with the project of uh, Park Avenue, uh, that particular project became very well known. And somehow it becomes a weight that you barely can hold. Uh, you want to move from there into another direction. And I presented this project back in 2014, which is titled The Map and the Fact. And again, I wanted to return to the idea of a space in the sense of experiencing a space through a specific object. And that object, it might be a detail of the watercolor. Mostly, like I was explaining, watercolor is the, the point of departure for my future work. And these are like the plans for my works. But what about the, you know, taking like a detail of that drawing and turn it into a reality? And then you have those both worlds like in dialogue, you know, the, 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 the fragment and the map as a general way to, to look at that fragment. But the, in this particular piece, a lot of elements uh, takes, uh, are taking place here. And one of those elements are, is photography. Photography is present there, and those black dots that you see there are photographs of um, uh, liquids, uh, drops of uh, liquids, whether it's water, whether it is urine, acid, uh, blood, you know. And for me, these yellow structures, they resemble the plowed field, this idea of fertility through photography documenting process that will enhance, uh, in this case, this particular space, because that's what I consider the sculpture as a space that you can actually experience uh, with, in, in different ways. This is another piece or another exhibition done in, in, in Havana back in 2015, uh, uh, the map of silence. I wanted to address issues related with silence uh, silence in Cuba is, uh, is something uh, meaningful in the sense that a, a society that have remained silent for so many years in order to uh, speak out the things or the burdens that, uh, that actually make them suffer. And in that sense, I wanted to deal with the idea of silence and, and what's behind silence. And there is something happening there. And again, I'm playing with this idea. The main piece there, which is that large map or, or mural that you see uh, in the background. Uh, in the center here, you see a bridge that is kind of sinking into that big map. But at the same time, this particular piece, which is a self-portrait, 
you see this open space here, uh, well, open space. <laughs> and then you see through that open space, uh, those same drops of acid, honey, milk, that are playing there, you know. So there's no such silence. There's something going on there. We rather need to organize it in ways to make it visible. So, and that's for me what uh, uh, this map of silence is and my intentions of exhibiting this in Havana. To continue with the experience of uh, outdoor projects and understanding context, which is uh, fundamental in my practice to understand context, I was again given the opportunity to, uh, to do a project for um, Coachella Festival. And I know the crowd that goes to Coachella, not because I know them, but I know who goes to Coachella. But this idea of bringing a topic that might be completely foreign to young people who are not familiar with it, it might become a, a beautiful goal. And I was explaining my experience with uh, New Orleans back in 2008 with, uh, with Dan Cameron and the Mississippi Bucket. And I wanted to bring Katrina, Katrina Storm again to a specific environment of people that might not be familiar with the disaster that happened in that city. So I created the Katrina chairs in this uh, opportunity, which are these chairs that on top I have set these uh, sort of like buildings that they are in a safe place, you know? But at the same time, the shadow that they project helps the, you know, the, these, these people to get a shelter. You know, uh, so for me, the idea to expose people, young people specifically, to events that have happened in the country that I think is important to tell them one more time what happened, or at least to relate to the idea. So for me, Katrina chairs have become one of those symbols of that uh, idea of resistance, of, of what it means for me to create public art projects that not only deal with the community, but also deal with a specific context and try to make a, or create a dialogue uh, that might be uh, uh, you know, useful in order to, uh, to create a better society, I believe. At the current time, I'm uh, creating this, uh, this new project. Let's say that I'm now going back to Havana again in a different way. Uh, this time, I have been uh, taking for, for months pictures of uh, corners of buildings in Havana. Especially, they are very colorful. And I wanted to create some kind of a palette or, a, you know, a, a kind of a, you know, controlling what's going on in this corner. So I visit mostly the same corner every certain, you know, you know, every 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 once in a while, you know, with the idea of looking at what's going on at that specific corner. You know, corners are meaningful in any culture. It's a place where you gather. It's a place, uh, you know, where you hang out when you were a kid. So corners, at some point, they become, you know, a fundamental element in the in the in the history of communities. But at the same time, it's uh, the prominent side of architecture, and it is this that, that might be the side that might suffer more damages from like scratches and this and that. So based on that history that might uh, be behind corners, I decide why not to create a new uh, a structure that somehow, again, talking about resistance, try to survive in between those uh, corners like the mask. The mask became for me, uh, or are becoming for me in the recent month, uh, that symbol of like trying to transform a city that is eagerly crying for change and bringing that change through the same structures that 
are already in place, but put it in ways that there are moments in which you lose what you're looking at. You don't know exactly what you're looking at uh, unless you get closer and understand there are that, those same corners that you have been looking at all these years. But now they are trying to be a different ones. So, and I believe with this last picture, this is uh, the end. <laughs> So I'm open to questions. Uh, I don't know if you might have any questions. I mean, this is, uh, I brought here, you know, a very reduced uh, amount of images in order to create some sort of like a, a coherent uh, evolution of my process. But obviously, I always feel I'm a student like you are, and I'm always, you know, uh, ready for any battle. <laughs> yes. Mr. Chair, I'm just wondering, as a, as a public artist, how, how important is it to you that when someone's walking down the street and they see one of your sculptures or a photograph of yours, that it's immediately understood? You know, the Katrina chairs, they're wonderful, but unless there's a name plaque, it's almost difficult to, right. to see what they represent unless you right. find out later. Right. Right. Um, is it important to you that people just... Well, you know, it is, it is always difficult to try to bring people to your field because, I mean, ideas, uh, somehow they are abstract and it is obviously hard to convince. But somehow what I, my trust is rather that what it represents, the way the, the, the structures are built. You know, in the case of a Katrina chairs, we're talking about a chair, and we're talking about a structure that is on top of a chair. This idea of an object that is being lifted and put on top of something uh, you know, it, 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 you know, you have to dig on the reasons of that. Obviously, ideas, they're not told in ways that you understand that at a, fair, at a first glance. You have to dig on them. And for me to bring the idea of a chair, the building, and a name like Katrina, this, this is a combination of three elements that if you start, like, you know, uh, digging into it, then you might actually get it to the point. But obviously, it is always difficult to, to get to the point in the sense that people can recognize immediately what you're talking about. This is a process that is accompanied uh, not only with uh, the event, but also with this talk that I'm doing here, continue promoting my ideas, continue spreading what I want in order to, for people you know, to understand. So it is. You know, for us artists these days, it's like the, the idea is not enough. We have to continue trying to especially ed educate, because that's uh, one of our goals as an artist, educate the society and, and, to understand, and, and educate it in ways that are sensitive enough to, uh, to understand, you know, simple things, you know. Uh, and, and, and to have the ability to go further to what it is being shown in front of you. You know, it is about to research. It is, I mean, the, the artwork doesn't end when you just give the back to it. It, it, it. If you want to continue digging into an idea, you have to give room into your head and continue trying to get the juices out of that, you know. question <laughs> you know your first picture the meat uh, thermometer yes and you took the the angle of the photography is y you were down on the yes the ground looking up and then you had that picture behind it well, uh, well first of all what were the dimensions of the sculpture and then the second question is is do you consider the pho the photo of that sculpture 
uh, uh, artwork itself? Well, you know, thank you for that question. I mean, I love to, to like, you know, once you do your work, I try to take the best shot as, that I can in order to, you know, to transmit a better perception of that part particular piece or pieces. And in, in this case, I mean, I took tons of pictures of the, uh, of the piece. But once I got down and I took that angle, I thought that that was uh, striking because it gives the, the, the sense of uh, surreal. It's, it's not like real, you know? And in the sense, the piece also carry that. It is surreal, but it's a possibility. It is happening. It is, a, it is true. And in that sense, I don't consider that particular photo an art piece, but definitely enhance the work that I have done. Okay. So you want me to dance? So I was talking to you earlier, and you know, for and we talked about well, what was your journey? Because you, how old were you when you were creating that first exhibition where they invited you in, and you were well, in, you know, in Havana. And then, like, what? How did you get to there? Like, for students, we were talking about like the journey. Like, how did you even start creating art? What What were your earlier right. years to well, get to there? You know, the first time that I exhibited, uh, I mean, because, you know, there are like these two periods in my life that, so I have to divide which one of them is like the first time. But let's say that there are two first times for me. There is a, that first time when I'm exhibiting, when I'm uh, 19 years old, uh, exhibiting in a, in a museum in Havana and giving that opportunity which in that case was very important in the sense that in the early 90s in Cuba, there was a, uh, I mean, the diaspora was like really big. Many of the main artists, uh, uh, you know, happening in Cuba at that time have flee the country. And they settled, whether it's here in the States, Mexico, or Spain. And that particular situation was, uh, for us at the time, we were really worried because we are losing the main figures that are, you know, helping us in order to really understand what art is. Those are our professors, uh, you know, younger artists are fleeing the country. And that first exhibition that I did, I knew that I was given the opportunity because, not only because probably my work was valuable in that sense or not, but also because there was an empty space. There was no one there. So we rapidly have to take advantage of that opportunity because you are that new generation who is about to transform your immediate reality. So, meaning that at that very young age, we were given a role for a mature artist. And you have to rapidly mature your ideas and work in order to really make it worth it, you know? Because it's not about exhibiting in museum. It's about the things that you exhibit there. Because it is an opportunity, but you have to play that opportunity very well. And well, not, I'm, I'm not saying that I did, and I understand that, you know, there are things that I, I could have done better than I did. I don't regret what I did, obviously, but uh, I love, now that I have that experience and I can talk about, I mean, from my perspective of what I did, it's not about the opportunity, it's about take that opportunity and do it well, because otherwise, you w are going to be given, I mean, you have to remember that we all are, you know, uh, role models somehow. And people are looking at you uh, all the time, whether you are students, whether you are a professor, you know. Society trusts the art world. 
because somehow we are a memory that have been here for so many centuries and we are meant to improve any new year and we are talking about a, a you know uh, art which is the more valuable thinking any culture and in that sense I always thought that as an artist we have a you know a position that sometimes we don't value enough because it's, it is we are supposed to transmit our experience to the future generations how we experience you know our life during the time that we were here and in that sense that's a very serious thing i, I mean you think of those ancient you know caves where you find either the bull or the hand the pit there that is an information that we value so much because that's our past that's our history same thing is happening with us you know what we do today that we do it well and it will survive for the future generation that's our footprint in this world and we have to value that and be serious with that and in that sense, it is about to keep working constantly, daily, not stop to think. Don't get driven by the market because that's is, it, is, it is part of the world, but it's outside. It's not, we cannot control that. But at least we can control what we do with our, either with our hands or whatever we use in order to create art. So in that sense, for me, the experience of doing that first show in Havana, I had the, I had to be conscious that my opportunity have come and I have to take it seriously. And you know, that, that I have kept throughout the years, this idea that, you know, I, I'm the first one who, mo who have to value what you do and then try to transmit that to others and try to make it or engage others into that. You know, it might not be like the biggest thing in the world, but it is my thing, and I try to protect it, and I try to spread it, and I try to communicate my ideas in ways like this one. That's why, for me, I really appreciate what Mark have done to invite me here tonight and be able to give this speech to you. So, <laughs> I don't want to get serious, guys. <laughs> So thank you very much. This has been really amazing for me. And uh, so I hope, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm leaving tomorrow, unfortunately, but not, but I'm coming back in the coming month. So, I mean, I'll be around.